transparency in politics, and in particular with respect to speaker president and campaign finance. So the first person to speak is Tom Crangle, another who is from South Carolina. I was the only person in the lobby for the ethics bill in 1990 and 1991 when it was being drafted by the General Assembly. And it was very clear at the time that one of the major purposes of the ethics bill was to require full disclosure of all matters relating to the campaign finance. And therefore, we feel that Bobby Harrell should release to the public, to the media in particular, full documentation, including receipts, to justify the massive amounts of reimbursement that he has paid to himself and the amount of $326,000 over the course of the last four years. The magnitude of that in and of itself would attract scrutiny. But the scrambled nature of his reports and the very incomplete and dodging answers he's given to the media aggravates one's suspicion that he hides something. <clears throat> we also want Bobby Harrell, in addition to releasing the full documentation, in support of his reimbursement, we want him to hold a press conference and answer questions from the media about these reimbursements. He's been running around like a rabbit being chased by dogs in a briar patch, trying to hide from the borders, but not explaining to them what he's been doing. We feel he needs to come clean, be a man, come out here from the state house and hold a press conference so that the one we're having today answer any and all questions asked about these huge reimbursements. I have also asked the Attorney General's office to investigate these reimbursements. And I have received a letter from Deputy Chief McIntosh saying that the Attorney General's office is not intended to do it. But it's very clear if you look at the statutes that this is the kind of matter which could be taken to the state by a jury. We urge Alan Wilson to do that, to take this matter to the state grand jury. I also would point out that the statute 1348 of the Ethics Act provides for the reimbursement or payment for ordinary expenses. It seems to me the magnitude of these expenses and flying around in the airport is extraordinary. Most Candidates for the General Assembly drive an automobile. They do not fly around in airplanes. And I would also point out that the Speaker seems to feel that his duties include almost anything he wants to do in building the county. If you look at the state constitution, if you look at state statutes, the duties of the Speaker are extremely limited. They do not include flying to the Master's Golf Tournament and charging his campaign account. I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have after you've heard the other speakers. Thank you. <clears throat> and now, Ashley Landis, Director of the South Carolina Policy Council. Good morning. Thank you for being here. Um, you know, I seem to open my remarks in press conferences these days with, I never thought I'd be standing up here with some of these folks. That's true again today. So why is the South Carolina Policy Council here? It's not over a particular politician. We wouldn't be up here if we were simply talking about a Speaker of the House who managed process and procedure internally, or whether or not he may or may not have violated ethics disclosure laws. That is not why we're up here today. In truth, the Speaker of the House is arguably the most powerful politician in South Carolina. His power is unparalleled, it is unchecked, and it is unbalanced. He has control over the judges, control over road money, control over the state budget, control over a large portion of the executive branch. 
This speaker has control over almost every function of state government, and that is why we're up here today. If it were any other politician, he would be under investigation, as so many other politicians have been over the last couple of years. And if it were in any other state besides South Carolina, he would be heavily scrutinized 24-7. But this is South Carolina, and this is the Speaker of the House. The public needs to know and understand how disturbing it is that no one has stepped up. No public officials are stepping up to hold this speaker accountable, even to asking questions. And that, more than anything, is what worries us. The governor and the attorney general flew around the state and talked about promises to be more <clears throat> um, persuasive and, and to lead the charge on ethics reform. Well, folks, they are both in a position to investigate whether or not the Speaker of the House has improperly spent his campaign funds, and they should. The public also should know that every House member is accountable for the actions of the Speaker because they put him in office. Those need to be explored. He reimbursed himself hundreds of thousands of dollars from his campaign account. And frankly, no one, again, asking questions. And when the State Ethics Commission, as was reported by the Post and Courier, offered a different opinion as to whether or not he should be allowed to write himself huge checks from his campaign fund, they were quickly silenced by a phone call from the Speaker's office. And that concerns us, too. This speaker has so much power that no one, no one seems willing to speak out and to do their job to restore public trust. So, when you have a situation like that, it comes down to the public standing up and to the public demanding accountability and to the public insisting that the public officials who are charged with protecting them step up to do so. The governor, the attorney general, and the members of the House are accountable. This speaker is beyond public reach for the most part. Again, that's why we're up here, because we've been talking about this for some time. But he should not be above the law. We deserve answers, and someone needs to take responsibility for restoring the public trust. And we hope that citizens will at least be aware, again, of the heavy-handed degree of power this politician has and of what seems to be a shutdown inside Columbia for questioning them. Thank you. Next is Talbert Black from the Campaign for Liberty. Thank you. I'm an engineer by education and by trade, so I like looking at numbers. So when I saw the numbers that uh, was reported in the Post and Courier, and also by Bobby Harrell, started to look into it. He claims to uh, reimburse himself for his airplane expenses a little bit less than what it would cost to charter an airplane. So I Googled what it would cost to, charge, uh, to charter an airplane. And what I found was uh, Blue Star Jets advertised his charter prices at $1,550 an hour. Then I looked at what the distance was and the flight time between Charleston Executive Airport and Columbia Owens Field is 91 nautical miles. According to published flight rates, that's a 34 minute flight in the Cirrus SR-22. So at that rate, it's a little under $900 an hour. So that makes sense if you're paying for a charter flight. But really, tell me, how many of you drove up here this morning, had in mind that you were going to expense back to your media outlet the cost of hiring a chauffeur minus a little bit to get over here. Does that really make sense? You know, probably what you do, or what most of us do when we expense travel, is a mileage rate. So I look, there is a federal mileage rate published for private aircraft. And some states publish rates as well. Washington State publishes a dollar or seven per nautical mile. The trip between here and Charleston then would be $97.37. The federal government also publishes a rate. It's a little bit higher than that, a dollar thirty-one mile. 
that gives us $119.21 to travel between here and Charleston. Alaska uses the GSA federal rate as well. So, well, maybe the cost of operating that Cirrus SR-22 is a little bit higher than what the published mileage rate is. Well, fortunately, Cessna has helped us out. They have an advertisement publishing a comparison between flying a Cessna and an SR-22. So I imagine they probably picked the highest legitimate rate they could for the SR-22 because they want to make themselves look good. They publish a cost of operating a Cirrus SR-22 at $131.03 per hour. That makes the 34-minute flight between here and Charleston $74.25. If he flew, as federal aviation records record, 110 times between here and Charleston over the last four years, at that rate, that's $16,335 and change. Far below $326,000. Well, he did have a trip to Key West in there. That's 497.3 nautical miles. 171 minutes. $371.90 one way. He could have flown between here and Key West every single weekend over the last four years and still would have only been $155,000. Where is the money going? Statute says campaign funds may not be converted to personal use. I'm not saying that he has, but I think the numbers bear further investigation. One other quick point. Campaign law also requires that your expenses be recorded and reported for the quarter in which those expenses occur. He's itemized expenses to the Associated Press. $17,325 reported on May, May 2011 for, his words, and his spreadsheet, 30 trips flown over seven months. November, December, January, February, March, April, May. That covers three quarters in which he's reporting expenses in one quarter. His expense reports, by his own account, are not accurate. Again, on September 27th, the Greenville News reported an uh, uh, expense report. June 3rd, 2009, $22,008 for 35 trips over the past seven months. You see a pattern here? November, December, January, February, March, April, May, seven months covering three quarters reported in one. His expense reports, according to his words, are not accurate, according to law. June 19, 2012, $3,976 for an administrative assistant. Covers most of the monthly pay for an employee in his Charleston business office whose duties include legislative scheduling and keeping up with campaign account. A payroll service cuts for a check along with other employees of his insurance agency. And he reimburses himself. Why is that check not cut his insurance agency? February 2nd, 2012, $36,733 in change, according to his report, a many-month lump sum for that administrative assistant, covering a year's worth of expenses, again, reported all in one quarter. According to his words, his expense reports are not accurately following the law. It bears further assistance. So I join with those who have spoken before me and call on Attorney General Alan Wilson, to use his office as he is supposed to do and request a state grand jury investigation. I also call on Governor Newton Haley to direct Mark Hill to join Alan Wilson to call on a state grand jury investigation as is their duty to further investigate these questionable expenses and questionable reporting. Thank you. Next, Terry Kibler from Ryan. Thank you all for being here.
this morning. Why is it in South Carolina so hard to get to the truth when it involves a politician? It's a sad day in South Carolina because <clears throat> we keep living up to the Center for Public Integrity's grade of an F when it comes to legislative accountability and ethics enforcement. Maybe next year, the Center for Public Integrity will also grade our state's newspapers for their integrity. The Post and Courier article that was published originally on September 24th did not accuse Speaker Harrell of any crimes. It did not state that Speaker Harrell was required to submit receipts for his ethics violence. The story did state, quite accurately, that politicians must, main, uh, must maintain documentation for their expenses for a period of four years. And it also stated that candidates must itemize their expenditures on disclosure forms with the Ethics Commission. The story stated that requests for clarifications from Speaker Harrell were made five times during their long <coughs> investigation. Had Speaker Harrell taken that opportunity to be forthcoming with his receipts, as he supposedly was with the Associated Press, this may never have been a story to begin with. Nowhere in the Associated Press story did it state that Speaker Harrell had disclosed receipts for all of his $300 plus thousand dollars self-reimbursement. I suppose that type of investigation would have taken more than a couple of hours to verify nearly $325,000 worth of receipts. And nowhere in that Associated Press story did it uh, clear Speaker Harrell of any wrongdoing. It simply stated that Speaker Harrell showed some receipts that appeared to back up his uh, assertions. Speaker Harrell has taken the position of a victim because he's been asked questions that he still refuses to answer. Speaker Harrell has engaged in a weak public relations campaign to convince the public that he has done nothing wrong. Maybe he hasn't but he has not been forthcoming. He says that he was attacked by a liberal media. Speaker Harrell has betrayed the public trust by refusing to provide an itemized report of his so-called legislative travel. He still has not provided receipts to any agency charged with the responsibility to enforce, enforce ethics rules in South Carolina. So what has the Speaker done since the original Post and Courier report? He's drawn even more questions from citizens as to whether the use of his private claim qualifies as official state business. And quite frankly, most of us have a hard time believing that the cost of his private claim qualifies as ordinary expenses. It now appears that Speaker Harrell has fully the media into doing his dirty work for him. Why do I say that? Because the appearance of the Post and Courier fabricating corrections to stories that did not need to be corrected is very disturbing. I have the Post and Courier story, and I would challenge every one of you to read every word of it and see where their story matches up with Speaker Harrell's allegations. The Associated Press story appears to be authorized to give the Speaker a pass on any questions of improper documentation of expenses from his campaign. When Speaker Harrell was questioned by the Post and Courier reporter and given ample time to explain his questionable filings, he refused to do so. He then handpicked the reporter to whom he showed some receipts but would not allow any copies to be made. Then Speaker Harrell claimed to be exonerated and cleared of wrongdoing. The Associated Press did no such thing when they reviewed his reimbursements. Furthermore, since when did a, does a reporter become the ethics enforcement agency for the state of South Carolina? Here are the facts. The Post and Courier reporter repeatedly asked for the receipts. This whole thing could have been avoided. 
When the story was published, the speaker met with a reporter and provided some receipts. Here are the questions that still need to be answered. Does Speaker Harrell have the receipts to verify all of his self-reimbursements? What ethics agency or committee has reviewed those receipts? Will the House Ethics Committee recuse themselves due to obvious conflicts of interest? Will our governor request SLED to investigate? Will our Attorney General investigate? And last but not least, will the public ever learn the truth? Thank you. And Phil Noble is the next speaker. Uh, I've got copies that I can give you on the uh, My name is Phil Noble. I'm president of the South Carolina New Democrats. The New Democrats are an independent reform organization started by the former governor, Richard Riley. Our focus is relentlessly pushing for real change and real reform in South Carolina government and politics. Others here today have recounted what Speaker Harold has done and, and what he should do to begin to make amends. We agree with these reforms. But what Speaker Harold did is not the problem, it's a symptom. It's a symptom of a much larger and more pervasive problem. That problem is a cancer of corruption that has infected government and politics in South Carolina. This cancer of corruption is affecting nearly every part of our politics. It's the corruption of special interest PAC contributions to flush campaign accounts of candidates who have no opponents. It's the cancer of no-show consulting contracts and sweetheart deals for legislators. It's the cancer of legislators with fat legal retainers, excessive contracts from state government agencies. It is the cancer of special pensions for legislators that no other state employee can get. It is a cancer of legislators refusing full reports of their, all sources of their income, but even above and beyond what our anemic ethics requirements demand. This cancer of corruption includes the House and the Senate, Democrats and Republicans, blacks and whites, upstate and low state. The cancer of corruption is eating away at the public trust of all elected officials. It is a breeding a near pervasive sense of cynicism among our citizens. And it is attacking the basic core principles of public service and honor that are the basic foundations of our democratic process. Perhaps worst of all is what Speaker Harrell and many of his colleagues respond when confronted with the evidence of the ethics failure. Their response is, well, it's legal. We haven't broken any laws. What a travesty coming from our lawmakers. Once upon a time, slavery was legal, but no one would ever contend that it was ethical or honest. <coughs> Given the recent public outcry over abuses, even legislators know that something must be done. Various committees are being appointed. Everyone seems to have buzzwords of ethics reform on their lips and on their agendas. But early indications are that most likely we're only going to get Swiss cheese ethics reform. Empty platitudes of law that have a lot more holes than cheese. We need a total, complete, and radical overhaul of every aspect of our ethics laws and the enforcement procedures to, to enforce them. Nothing less will stop this cancer and rid our body politics of the corruption which is slowly crippling and debilitating the politics and the government of our state. Thank you. And now, Brett Bursey from the South Carolina Progressive Minister. And they'll ask me for four questions. And um, I want to 
thank the policy council for coming out. We don't agree on much, but we do agree on this transparency stuff that everyone's talking about. We deserve to know who's buying our politicians and who's buying and who the politicians are buying. The Progressive Network would prefer to view the problem as not one of transparency, but one of money. Um, the problem isn't Bobby Carroll. The problem is money. And everyone agrees that money has corrupted our political system and shrugs and says, but there's nothing you can do about it. Well, there are five states that have passed what we call clean elections, voter-owned elections, that give people an opportunity to run for office using no private money whatsoever. So that's something we want people to be pondering. But the question of Harold's filing of, like, in his personal campaign account, if he filed a record, perhaps it would be legal. In his Palmetto Leadership Council, it's legal what that council does in bundling money and getting around limits to individual politicians. We have a system that is legal that allows money to influence politics in a way that in most countries that have elections, you would go to jail. Mr. Harold, if the rules are working, would make his case to the House Ethics Committee, a peculiar institution that's composed of House members, to hear the wrongdoings or potential wrongdoings of House members. Of the six members of the House Ethics Committee, Mr. Harold has given five of them at least $1,000 in the last few years. And the question of transparency is something that the media should dig into because it is, it's, it's you. It's you that's the voice of we the people. The money has drowned it out. The incumbents, the intransigency of incumbents. We can't get any interest in bills to reduce the influence of money in politics or change the way the system works today because 170 people up there, it worked for them. They won with the current practice. They won with the current number of voters. They won with the campaign finance system we have. So it's up to the people and the media to be able to tell the people there are alternatives. Open up the books, let's see the transparency. Go online to the State Ethics Commission, who's had the budget cut in half in the last few years, and try and use that system, the online system, that the Progressive Network in 1998 set up the first basis for online. And you will find that if you wanted to search one of the, uh, the Ethics Committee members, the money that they received, you have to do it in six month increments. And you have to start the search over and over again. It's tedious, and I don't know if it was designed that way. But we need the media's help to be able to teach people about the way money is corrupting the process. 90 plus percent of the people that spend the most money in this year's election will win their seat. We have the least contested elections in the nation. We're going to go from no number 50, 50th in the nation in terms of contested elections, to 50 plus because we threw out 250 candidates because they didn't follow the rules the incumbents drew that they didn't have to follow. So we will have 82 percent of the 170 legislators serving in the session without any opposition in the general election. We have some systemic problems that need to be discussed and fought over, but there's one that we agree with the Policy Council on, is transparency and getting to the bottom of Mr. Harrell's ethics. And that uh, Sure. Thank you. Both uh, the governor and the attorney general have talked about ethics reform, and state um, house Democrats and Republicans have talked about ethics reform for this upcoming session. The governor and the attorney general, when they flew around, talked about um, moving things from the state senate and house ethics committees before the state ethics commission to be dealt with there. What do you guys think about that proposal? Any of you? <clears throat> yes, absolutely. That's one of the things that we've been pushing for that we agree would be part of a good start. There, there should not be any self-policing in the legislature, and we have seen that not work pretty much every time. It's a secret process controlled by their colleagues. It all ought to be done by one agency that ought to have the authority and the power to investigate every elected official equally. And that this is a very good example of why that reform needs to be part of the part of with uh, Meg, we, the Progressive Network had legislation that we drafted years ago to move the investigatory part of ethics 
to the state commission. The punishment part would probably have to stay within the body because of the separation of powers. But the investigation should be, could be done by the Ethics Commission, who, as I pointed out, has half their budget cut in the last few years. Could I just make this point about the State Ethics Commission? If it is assigned the responsibility of investigating legislators, you're going to have to have a protected budget, which means you'll have to get your appropriations five years in advance, and the General Assembly would be prohibited from cutting them back. Uh, if you look at what happened in Alabama a few years ago, where they had a state ethics commission with a jurisdiction over the legislature, and that state ethics commission went after some big time legislators, they probably got their budget cut by 75%. So the danger of retaliation is very serious, and um, right now the state ethics commission hardly has enough money to pay the light bill. Uh, and if they get the budget cut even further, they're going to be going to non existent. Questions? Do you think there's an issue with uh, the uh, abilities and powers with the speakership itself or the way this speaker has used those powers, or both? Who, whomever. Ashley, go ahead. Um, yes, there is definitely an issue with the powers of the speaker at all. Legislative leaders, four of them, control 150 appointments to the executive branch. The Speaker of the House appoints half of the members of the Judicial Merit Screening Commission, who screen out the judges on which the legislature votes. So yes, there is a serious problem with the power of the South Carolina Speaker of the House. This particular speaker is an example of what happens when the power goes unchecked. And this is why we're up here, because you know, these questions need to be asked precisely because the Speaker of the South Carolina House has so much extraordinary power over virtually every function of state government, all three branches. Other question? Another question? Yeah, the State Attorney General's office uh, said yesterday that, again, that the House Ethics Committee is the appropriate authority to take this to first, and that they really don't have any, any power to handle it for them. Um, how, how would you respond to that? Mr. Franklin has had some recent dealings on that question that you've heard of. Yeah, you're just thinking you have a copy of the letter that I got back from the agent's office. Um, they didn't say they didn't have jurisdiction. They indicated in Gregory's statement that they have a policy position where they're not going to conduct investigations unless they have appropriate problems to support the investigation. But the difference between what they want to do and what they're permitted by the Constitution to do, it's very clear to me they have the authority to investigate the body guard situation. And the AG has the authority to ask the court to authorize the state grand jury investigation. Right. There's, there is kind of, to be fair though, there is kind of a mixed message coming out there. What they're saying officially does not match up with the letter that you got. Uh, I can only say what they told me yesterday was that the House Ethics Committee has to handle it first. Yeah, well, I was involved in lobbying for the legislation. I'm the Lord, I can read statute books and the Constitution, and I disagree with their construction of the law. I'd just like to say this. I think what we're being told is that because we can't get a dog to guard the hen house, we've got to allow the fox to guard the hen house. Because that's what it really boils down to, folks. When you allow the internal policing that's going on, I don't care if the excuse comes from the governor or if it comes from the attorney general. The bottom line is we, the public, have a right to know the truth of what has happened. And as long as we have to depend on folks that are influenced by the very person that they are going to investigate, we can not have that confidence. Now, if it takes the citizens of South Carolina funding this, I'll be the first to chip in a few bucks to buy a dog. Any other questions? Uh, our folks will be here for a little while. We're going to ask some questions independently. Thank you for coming. Thank you.